It's a big garden. It's going to be worth a lot of money. They could be protecting it. Get everybody there approximately 545. That should get us in there just about sunup. Be moving it by 6. Yeah, we'll do that tomorrow. That's the best garden I've seen this summer. Steve Reed is an individual that truly believes in what he's doing. He believes, and I'm convinced, and I know, that Steve Reed makes a difference. A person does not essentially wrap himself around a cause and have as much zeal as a Steve Reed without being absolutely sure in their mind, in their heart, that they are serving a higher, a higher mission, a higher cause for the benefit of society. And that's exactly what he does. The war on drugs is the last dying smell from the Nixon administration. This isn't a war, it's a misuse of the word. It's an apparatus of control. You can tell it all, by the way, by the name they give to the person who's in charge of this mad scheme, a czar. The whole point of the United States is no bloody czar. No monarch of any kind. And I'm proud to nominate John P. Walters, where he will serve as a valuable member of my cabinet. But the Tsar is exactly the right name for this program and for this mentality. When we push back, the drug problem gets smaller. It's absolutist, it's unquestionable, it's fanatical, and it's corrupt. What keeps this thing going is the government, especially the federal government and organizations like the Partnership for Drug-Free America, their willingness to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars oftentimes, on propaganda putting out propaganda in every case that's essentially an ounce of truth embedded in a pound of lies and bull and exaggeration. Wanna get high? No way, man. That stuff's for losers. The creation of the media campaign was an enormous achievement in, in our office. Oh, the legalizers were livid. You can't fight drugs by TV. Guess what? Everybody advertises on TV, whether it's Coca-Cola to political campaigns to the value of being drug free and the dangers of using drugs like marijuana. Man, watch out! And, and it worked. We had some very effective ads. There was a 13% reduced proclivity of people to, of kids to use drugs when they saw the ad that had the actor smashing the dishes. We had another very good ad that had um, my mommy talks to me about everything. This is a little girl. And she talks to me about this and that and this and that. And what does your mother say to you about drugs? Dead silence. Those are my two favorite ads that I thought were enormously powerful. This absurd uh, uh, continuation of this prohibition is largely a function of ignorance. In 1967, because I was so concerned about this drug marijuana, I decided to do a review of the literature. I was then persuaded by Harvard University Press to do a book. The book came out in 1971, Marijuana Reconsidered. I learned that uh, what was being said about this drug was, uh, was mythological. You couldn't find the data to really support it. It turns out that marijuana came across as a remarkably non-toxic drug. Cannabis is a plant. Now, in the plant, there are somewhat more than 60 molecules called cannabinoids. THC is the most active. THC stands for tetrahydrocannabinol. People find smoking marijuana very useful for a whole host of symptoms. And if you inhale it, you get the effect within a very short period of time. So you can titrate it. By titrate it, I mean uh, you can take just enough to get rid of your symptoms and stop. The government hates to admit that they've already acknowledged that marijuana is a medicine. They acknowledged it in the 1970s and 80s when they allowed dozens of Americans to receive a monthly supply of marijuana from the government's marijuana farm at the University of Mississippi. Some of those people are still alive and still obtaining it today, their can monthly canister of marijuana.
Now, here's where I keep my cannabis. Keep it refrigerated, it stays fresher. I receive one tin of 300 pre-rolled cigarettes, approximately 300 cigarettes, every 25 days from the federal government. And here it's hermetically sealed with wax to try to keep the freshness and the strength up. This marijuana was actually grown right here in April of 1996. So it's been packaged and frozen since then. And then you open it up. Okay, inside you'll see that there's approximately 300 rolled cigarettes to this tin. and sold by a cigarette machine. What this can means to me is for the next 25 days, I don't have to worry about medicine. That I know that I'll be as well as I possibly can be. And that I don't have to worry about if somebody's going to bust my door down and come arrest me because of this medicine. The disorders that I suffer from are multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis and a variant of the syndrome pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. In lay terms, what it means is bone tumors that grow outwardly from the long bones such as this grow outwardly into the muscles and the veins, stretching the muscles and the veins, making it very painful. But more important, any kind of movement can tear the muscle or tear the vein, and I could hemorrhage and a clock could break off, go to my heart, my brain, my lungs, I'm dead. I usually try to get in, if I can, 10 to 12 marijuana cigarettes per day. What the cannabis definitely does is relax the muscles going over these tumors. Thereby, I can move and, and not have to worry about tearing anything. I'm ready to go to work and, and I try to make some money for myself and my clients. More important for my clients. Uh, when people see me taking my medicine, they don't understand that it's medicine, and they think all I'm trying to do is get high, and that, and that I've got you know, some kind of balls to be able to do it, do it in public. Of course, I try to explain to them right away that it's medical use provided by the federal government. And I'm sure most people just kind of laugh and go, yeah, right. I became the second person in the United States to receive medical cannabis from the federal government. Robert Randall is the first patient. We welcome to Larry King Live, Bob Randall, the first American ever to gain legal access to marijuana because of his glaucoma condition. Why are you allowed to use these, Robert? I have a disease called glaucoma, and marijuana at this point is the only drug that will help prolong my sight. You could smoke it now legally, couldn't you? Sure. Do it for me. Okay. Yes. This is a first. I want yeah, you to know, Larry. <laughs> I spent 27 years with Bob Randall, and 25 of those years he was using 10 marijuana cigarettes a day, federally supplied. And I can assure you he was not a stoner. Um, he had a terrific memory. He was extremely articulate. He was highly motivated when it came to, particularly to this issue. I think the only thing surprising here is that a small group of unelected bureaucrats have so long resisted making marijuana medically available. Essentially, it comes down to almost a theologic argument. They want to pretend that marijuana is simply evil, and I think we have to be more rational than that. We have to realize that marijuana has good and bad uses. Bob was treated on every conventional medication that was available, and it was only through the addition of marijuana that his eye pressure was lowered to within the safe range. Told at 25 that he would be blind by the time he was 30, marijuana made the critical difference, and Bob could see up until the time of his death in 2001. We were arrested in August of 1975 for growing four marijuana plants on our sun deck in Washington, D.C. And once Robert found out that the federal government was already conducting research, on marijuana as a possible glaucoma treatment, that made him very angry. He could not reconcile in his mind that we were being called criminals for what the federal government was already well aware of. So we went to trial in July of 1976, and the lawyers pleaded that Robert needed medical access to marijuana based on his medical need. 